than a wicked in hip hop. We actually have a quite some content to cover today. So let's see, but we just give you a heads up, we might go a little bit over, slightly over today, like five minutes something, right? So because we are quite some, we have quite some content. So first quickly administrative stuff. So there are actually some uh, miscommunication between the TAs and me on the due date of the homework, but essentially to make things simple, uh, we are going to make the due date of homework for to be November the 10th. Right, it's the same on the write-up, on grade scope, on the slides, November the 10th, that's the due date for homework four. And then for project three, the due date is the same, right? It's gonna be November the 14th, on Sunday. And again, we are going to hold an additional office hour on November the 13th, but just please don't, don't wait for the last day uh, to, to, start, to even get started. Because again, many of you have used all your late days already, right? So just uh, uh, keep, keep that in mind. All right, again, uh, today, right after this class, there will be uh, this uh, database talk on, uh, from Pinecone, right? Like a talk about their uh, vectorized database system uh, for use, essentially used for machine learning. Right? Again, it's, I think it's a co-founder of Pinecone coming to give this talk. I think uh, the person was actually the previous head of the Amazon AI lab, right? So now he's doing this database startup. Okay, and our content today. So last class, we sort of talk about uh, this uh, canonical uh, concurrency control protocol called two-phase locking, as well as the uh, variance of it, right? Strong strict two-phase locking to ensure that uh, our schedule of transactions can be uh, serializable, right? Always generate a quote-unquote correct schedule. And uh, beyond that, we also talk a little bit about a hierarchical locking, which means that, I mean, it will be very costly, for example, if a transaction or a query from a transaction needs to scan a table with a billion tuple, but needs to acquire a billion logs for every tuple inside this table, right? This will be very, very costly and also kind of wasteful uh, work. So last class, we talked a little bit about this concept of hierarchical locking, where we can actually choose what, when, at which level of this uh, lock tree, if you will, that a transaction is going to acquire local, right? For example, if a transaction needs to read all the data from a table, then it can just acquire a single higher level lock on the table instead of, for example, acquire many, many small locks on this tuple one, tuple two, uh, until tuple n, right? And to, and of course, to do that, we need locks on different level in our system, or in other words, this is the lock tree. And to, org to coordinate those logs at different level in our system, uh, we sort of introduced a few uh, concepts here, right? We call it intention lock. And specifically, there are three types of intention locks. Uh, one type we call the intention share, which means that we are not locking anything on the current level, for example, a higher level such as table, but we are going to lock a few uh, leave nodes below this uh, current level, right? for example, two posts with share lock, right? That's intention share. <laughs> and similarly, intention inclusive, we're not locking anything at the current level, but we are going to lock a few leave nodes below my current level with the exclusive lock. And lastly, uh, shared intention inclusive means that we are going to grant a, or acquire a share lock on the current level, for example, a share lock on the table. But in the meantime, I may also want to acquire a few exclusive lock on the levels below, all right? And we are going to use these three intention locks to coordinate locks among different transactions and different levels in the database system, right? So here, I'm going to talk about the specific lock protocol using uh, those uh, uh, intention locks. And it's actually uh, not that uh, complicated, right? Essentially, uh, the transactions just a pro acquire lock at the uh, highest level of the database first if it needs to access all the tuples, right? For example, if a transaction needs to uh, read all the uh, tuples in the table, it'll just first try to acquire a lock on the table level, right? But there are a few circumstances that would prevent such lock to be acquired. That's how we use intention locks to coordinate different things. For example, essentially, if we want to get a shared lock or a intention share lock on a specific node or specific level in our lock tree, then this transaction must must hold at least one intention share lock on the parent node, right? I mean, again, uh, to give you an example, if, say, if I want to hold a share lock or intention share lock on a specific tuple, then I must hold a intention share lock on my parents and grandparents, etc. For example, the table, the database, etc. right? Up until the node, I need hold intention share lock on all my uh, ancestors. Make sense, right? Because in my ancestors, I have the intention to acquire a share lock 
I mean, from the children. And similarly, if I want to get a uh, inclusive lock or intention inclusive lock or shared intention inclusive lock on a node, then I must hold at least a intention exclusive lock on my parents, grandparents, etc., up until to the node. And use that, we can coordinate uh, from with other transactions that, hey, I'm accessing um, this part of the subtree of my entire hierarchy of the data, then other transactions may or may not acquire certain logs accordingly. Right? And then the, I had a slide from the last class I didn't show today that have the compatibility matrix of different shared logs and intention shared logs, et cetera. Right? And when transaction want to acquire logs, it follows these rules as well as it will just check the uh, compatibility matrix that I showed from last class to see whether it can acquire a lock or not. So now to give you a specific example. Right here, say so you just have two transactions, right? Transaction T1, I uh, want to get uh, some balance uh, from uh, my, want to check the balance of my bank account. And then the transaction T2 just uh, increase Andrew's bank account by uh, the balance by 1%, right? <laughs> And then again, we'll use uh, exclusive and shared lock for all the leaf nodes of the lock tree uh, I showed you before. And then for everything else, for the internal nodes, right? We'll just uh, use uh, intention locks, uh, try to coordinate with other transactions on what I want to do, right? Okay, here. <laughs> so uh, let's say, assuming that we only have, uh, for simplicity, right? We we'll assume that we only have two levels here. And actually, in practice, uh, usually tuple level is just the finest uh, level or the lowest level. Um, usually people will not go to the attribute level to acquire super fine grain logs to just uh, add complexity to the overall management, right? Like as overhead. So, uh, but, but people, people may have a little bit of uh, some middle level, for example, page level, right? That's the, that could also be a uh, level that uh, people use. And of course there could be database level, but here, uh, assuming that we only have a table level as well as tuple level, right? Then transaction T1 comes along, I just want to read uh, the record uh, in my bank account, right? So here, we will just, uh, we want to perform this read, and it will first acquire a intention shared lock on the uh, table level, right? Because it will need to read a level, it read, read a record in the lower level uh, from uh, this, uh, this uh, table R node. And then after that, it will just acquire a shared uh, lock on this uh, tuple one, right? Then uh, transaction T2 comes along, it wants to update Andrew's bank uh, record. Uh, just for example, Andrew's record would be denoted as a tuple n there. Then it will just first acquire a intention inclusive lock on uh, the, this uh, node table R, and then acquire a exclusive lock on this uh, tuple n, right? To get the a exclusive access on the tuple n and update it. And here, intention shared lock is actually compatible with intention exclusive lock, right? So on table R, there can be both two locks exist and there's no conflict here. Make sense? Any questions? Okay, right, this is easy, right? <laughs> so, but but, but in, the, in the trivial example, the intention lock seems a little bit useless, right? So here, give you a use case where these intention locks would actually be useful to coordinate the scheduling between uh, different transactions. So here, uh, we assume that we have three transactions. Well, T1 will scan actually the entire relation R and update a few tuples, okay? And T2 will read a single tuple from R, right, just one. And then T3 will just scan everyone, uh, everything in R, but without updating anything, right? Let's see how that works. So here, <laughs> again, T1 come along, wants to scan everything and then update a few tuples. For example, it wants to update the tuple in here. What we will first to do is that it will first acquire what? Acquire a shared intention exclusive log on table R, right? Because it needs to scan everything in table R, it will be a wasteful work if it acquire a shared log on every tuple in R, right? So it will just acquire a, well first acquire a, at least it needs to acquire a shared log on relation R, right? But at the meantime, it also needs to update a few tuples. So the combination of the two would make this transaction T1 to want to acquire a shared intention exclusive log on table R. Make sense? And then after that, it, it will have the ability to read every tuple there, but uh, in order to update tuple n, it needs to acquire a specific exclusive log on tuple n, right? Then it can update it, okay? And then tuple, I mean, the transaction two come along, right? Transaction two wants to read a single tuple in R. So what does it need to do? Well, just don't deal with it here. It first will need to acquire a intention share log, right? Because it's not read everything. It's not need to, it does not need to acquire a share log on table R, 
but it needs to read something down below, right? So it needs a intention share lock. And here, it also needs to uh, acquire a share lock on tuple, tuple one, right? Because that's a specific tuple it needs to read. And again, the shared intention exclusive lock is compatible with intention exclusive lock. So there could be both lock exist on table R, right? And lastly, transaction T3 also comes along and it wants to scan every tuple in table R. But here, in this case, what it needs to do is that it also wants to, I mean, acquire a share lock on table R, right? But here, what happened is that, well, it, it wants to apply this, this share lock, but unfortunately, this shared lock on table R is not compatible with shared intention exclusive, right? Because transaction T1 is updating something down below, it cannot, you cannot grant a shared lock to T3 at the same time on this table R uh, node. So transaction T3 has to wait. And let's, for example, after a while, transaction T2 finishes, and then locks are gone, right? But at the, at the meantime, at, at, at this time, T3 is still blocked, right? It's still com not compatible with a shared intention exclusive lock. And only after a while, transaction T1 finally finishes, and then this lo the lock was released, transaction T3 now can come to grab this shared lock on table R, and then finally read everything uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on the leaves, on the two ports, right? There's actually a, a um, small lock uh, mark that I forgot to remove, but, but essentially that should also be gone. The locks should also be gone to one as well, while, while transaction T1 releases all its locks. All right? As all this uh, coordination between intention locks and lower level locks makes sense? Okay. No question? Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, it just means that the lock finally granted, right? Sorry, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but for your earlier question, you can always upgrade, right? And a shared intention exclusive lock can be upgraded to be, to be a shared lock uh, if, there's, if it's compatible right, with the current locks on that particular node. You can always upgrade. Uh, yeah, we, we can talk about details of, offline, but in general, you can upgrade. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what this uh, all these hierarchical locks give us? Again, to iterate, it gives us the ability to acquire as few locks as possible, right? To to make sure a transaction uh, gets can protect all the records it needs to protect and avoid conflicts. But in the meantime, with those intentions, it gives different transactions a way to coordinate between each other and allow the uh, maximum amount of parallelism or concurrency as possible, right? So, yeah, again, so intention share lock, which just means intend to get a share lock at final granularity. Intention exclusive means that intend to get a exclusive lock at lower granularity. And then lastly, the last lock just means that you are going to get a share lock on this node, but intend to get a exclusive lock on the lower levels. Right. All right. So uh, another thing that uh, some systems do is that um, beyond just the, the system just automatically figures out, hey, I want to uh, apply a, uh, or <laughs> yeah, I want to acquire a share lock on the entire table. But sometimes uh, if the, the system realize that a transaction is reading many, many tuples at a particular level of the tree, right? It also has the option to, to come back to the parent, right? To upgrade the lock level on the parent node uh, to be a stronger level, right? For example, if a transaction did not acquire a share lock on a table in the first place, but while it is executing, the system realized that, hey, you are reading too many tuples in this, in this, in this table, right? You, you're just better off just acquire a share lock on the entire table. So you can come back and upgrade uh, the lock on the, on, the, on the entire table to be a share lock, for example, right? Just as an optimization, uh, some system would uh, apply. So uh, another thing about uh, these uh, different uh, locks in, in system is that generally uh, system will not allow you actually to uh, specify these locks manually, right? Like I mentioned before, the whole point of this system is mostly to 
uh, guarantee this acid property and deal with all those like tuples override, power failure, etc. for the programmers, right? So that the programmer can just focus on the core logic of the data and develop the logic of your application, I mean, to generate a value, right? But in some cases, right, some systems would actually uh, allow you to specify uh, this acquisition of logs if you know what you are doing, essentially, right? If you know that, hey, uh, I'm, I just, do, I, I know that I need a bulk, for example, upload of a bulk change in this table. I want to, um, uh, for example, calculate the interest of the entire table, right? Or update a subsequent field of the entire table. If I know what I'm doing, then, I mean, system would actually allow you to specify uh, the log as well, right? If you, if you want to do that to help the system optimize the performance. So uh, essentially, uh, there are different uh, ways to do that in different system. Uh, you can either, I mean, some system would call it shared exclusive, and some other system would call it a read log or write log. But essentially, uh, what, you can, what you can do is that you can specify uh, these logs with, um, with these uh, various commands. Right? This actually, I think this is actually not in the SQL standard. Right. So this is actually as many system would allow, would allow you to do as an optimization if you know what you are doing. Right. And the different system would actually have, would have a different commands to let you to do that. Right. But what is actually more common, right, is actually uh, used by uh, more people is a, a specific command or syntax called slack for update. Right. So instead of directly tell the uh, system to uh, lock the entire tube table or to lock a specific uh, tuple, many people will do is actually is that if you are write a application, right, or you are you are you are uh, you are you are writing a transaction that uh, accessing a database that you know you first want to read, I mean, a few uh, records, and then after that you immediately want to update those records, then you can actually use uh, this uh, specific clause to select a few uh, tuples, I mean, read their values, and then grant, uh, ask the system to grant exclusive or write log on those tuples at the meantime, right? So that next time when you issue the next query, the next query is going to update these few tu tuples, you don't have to um, re-go to the, go to the log manager again and reacquire a exclusive log, right? When you are reading those tuples, I mean, originally you only need a share log, but in the meantime, if you use this command, select something and add this for update keyword after that, the system will just uh, uh, try to acquire exclusive log on those two posts uh, all together, right? So that it will prepare the transaction to be ready uh, for the upcoming uh, update queries, uh, if you have that intention. And again, there's just uh, some way that programmers can do to hint the system uh, what logs it needs to acquire to reduce the overhead and potentially improve the performance, all right? So any uh, questions so far with the hierarchical locking uh, and the, uh, these uh, commands to specifically uh, tell the system to acquire uh, certain logs? Okay, no questions, we are going to uh, move on to the next topic of the diff a different concurrency control approach, all right? So, so far in the, in the class, we will talk about uh, focusing on this uh, two-phase locking concurrency control protocol as well as uh, some, a few of its variants, right? For example, um, uh, this um, strong strict 2PL or rigorous 2PL, and we also talk about hierarchical locking. And uh, the, the larger category that these types of concurrency control protocol belong to would be called pessimistic concurrency control, right? Essentially, by pessimistic, it just means that you assume the conflict is going to happen very often. So before you uh, access any record, you're just going to put a lock on, on, around, around it, right? Either whether it's a share lock or exclusive lock, but you are going to lock it anyway to protect this transaction from the potential conflicts, right? But then there's another category of uh, concurrency control protocol will be considered optimistic, right? So what that means is that instead of assuming transactions, oh, sorry, conflicts, or uh, yeah, instead of assuming conflicts are going to happen very often, you're going to assume that in most cases, right, transactions don't really conflict with each other, right? They may access different tuples in the database, et cetera, or the transaction rate may not just be, may just not be that high uh, to begin with. So conflicts are rare. So what you are going to do is that <laughs> you are not going to grant logs. Instead, you are going to, in most cases, you are going to pre-assign a uh, scheduling order of those transactions, and in most cases based on timestamps, and you are just going to assume that 
these transactions can finish their execution without any conflict. Uh, in other words, equivalent to a serial execution, uh, just, yeah, and, and then all commit. And, and if there are actually uh, conflicts with the predefined uh, serial execution order, then you just uh, deal with the conflicts afterwards, all right? But in this case, you don't really acquire log uh, before you access the data, okay? So that's uh, what we are going to uh, focus on today, all right? So, uh, I mean, again, just uh, for this uh, broader category of uh, timestamp ordering concurrency control or optimistic concurrency control, the, the fundamental intuition is just use the timestamp of different transactions to determine the serialization order of them, right? And then after you determine order, you're just going to follow this order and make sure that this, all the transactions, they, they have a schedule that would have an execution result equivalent to this uh, predefined uh, order, right? When I say predefined, it's not entirely true, right? Some, some, in some cases, you can actually come back to modify the timestamps, but in most cases, right, the timestamp will be fixed. And uh, here, to define it more formally, we say a transaction uh, has a, when we, we say a transaction TI has a timestamp uh, smaller than a transaction uh, TJ, when the system would generate a scheduling of the transaction so that the, when in the serial uh, order of the execution of these transactions, TI is always going to be, uh, appears before TJ. Right? That would be the uh, formal definition, right? So a little bit, talk a little bit about how do we assign these timestamps. So uh, again, um, in most cases, right, this uh, timestamp of a transaction is just a fixed, uh, although in some advanced cases, you can tweak it afterwards to allow potentially a little bit more parallelism. And an important property of this timestamp is that it always increases, right? You can't really uh, first assign a transaction with a timestamp, uh, like say one or, or five, and a, and a while later, you come back and assign a tra another transaction, a timestamp smaller than that, right, say two then that would be a very difficult schedule. In practice, it's always a monotonically increasing. Um, and then different systems actually assign uh, this timestamp at uh, different, uh, different, uh, uh, different times when the transaction executes. In most system would actually assign the timestamp of a transaction when the transaction begins, right? That's just uh, very straightforward. But some, some systems will actually assign an additional timestamp uh, when the transaction finishes. And some, some systems actually use both of the timestamps and then uh, coordinate this timestamp to figure out what would be the uh, best way to allow a better, a better scheduling of these different transactions, right? But for simplicity, uh, here we just, unless otherwise specified, we just assume that the system would allocate a timestamp for a transaction when the transaction begins and stick to that, right? For simplicity, we just first assume that unless we specify other words. So uh, there are also different choices or implementation strategies uh, to allocate this timestamp. Uh, most most systems actually uh, don't would not. I mean, the first would be use the, the system clock, right? You just use the uh, get timestamp function from your system. But the most system would actually not use uh, this approach. Well, mostly as you can imagine, first is uh, very dependent on the operating system, right? And and you can you don't really have a kind of control over that. And second of all, I mean, when for example when I think a week later, right, we, we have this uh, daylight shift, right, from, uh, from the daytime to, uh, to I mean, when we sh shift the daytime by an hour, for example, right, the system, the timestamp in the system may, may sometimes change. And then that will make, that may cause lots of problem if you are just to rely on the system clock. So what most people do is actually to use a logical counter, right? So just internal to that database system, you just have a counter to keep track of the timestamp of different transactions, right? And when the uh, next transaction comes, you will just uh, increment this uh, counter by one, right? That's, uh, that's what most system will do. But of course, if then now you have this uh, centralized location to allocate all the timestamp, and sometimes this, this centralized uh, timestamp counter may actually become a, a contention bottleneck of the system, right? And there are also ways to deal with that. But uh, that's, most, that's what most, most systems will do. And the next will be called a hybrid timestamp. That's actually uh, would be more common in a distri distributed systems, right? Because in distributed system, you, well, if you want to have a centralized logical counter, then again, it will need to be centralized on a specific machine, right? You have network traffic. 
But at the meantime, if you want to use a system clock on different machines, well, then you also have a sort of a synchronization problem, right? It's difficult to make sure that all the logs on uh, different machines in a distributed system would always be sync. So in that case, in oftentimes you would use a hybrid clock, right? You use the timestamp uh, or the system, system clock uh, of each system, but also at the meantime, you also have a way uh, to use uh, some sort of a logical counter to coordinate things to, without relying on all the logic, all, all the physical clocks or system clocks on all the system to be synced, right? So just to give you a little bit um, heads up, but in, for this um, for this class, we're not going to, into details. For the advanced class, I think there might be some uh, discussion, right? So uh, today's agenda, we are going to first talk about a, well, actually, there's a little bit of naming issue. So all these um, concurrency control protocol we're going to talk about in this class would belong to the category of optimistic concurrency control. And they all rely on timestamps to perform the concurrency control protocol. But in the meantime, there are also specific algorithms or implementations of the concurrency control protocol belong to this category. First one called basic timestamp ordering protocol and the second one called optimistic concurrency control uh, protocol. And these are actually the names of two specific implementations, right? Even though all of them are optimistic and all of them use uh, timestamps, right? So looking back, they probably should come up with better names, but uh, I mean, this is just the name people use uh, until today, right? And, and lastly, we are going to talk a little bit about the estimation levels. All right, any questions so far? So first, let's talk about the uh, very basic uh, timestamp ordering concurrency control protocol, right? So again, uh, the premises of timestamp ordering or uh, optimistic concurrency control would be that transactions don't really need to uh, read and to, to, don't really need to acquire logs before they read or write objects, right? Instead, they are going to maintain timestamps on these uh, records and use a timestamp to guide their uh, scheduling or serialization. And specifically, every transaction when it access a object X, for example, it will maintain two timestamps uh, in the basic timestamp ordering uh, concurrency control protocol. One would be the write timestamp, and the other uh, very straightforward would be a read timestamp, right? And then it will update the read write uh, timestamp every time it perform, for example, a read or write operation. And then the basic intuition of basic uh, timestamp ordering concurrency control protocol is that when the transaction access a record, if it figures out that it is trying to um, either read or write a record that has been uh, read or modified by a transaction that would logically happen in the future, which means that the, the object already have a higher read or write timestamp than my current transaction should have bought, right? Because it violates the predefined serial order of the scheduling of these transactions by the timestamps, all right? So that's the basic intuition, and we'll get to uh, details and examples, right? So again, the specific check the transaction needs to do is that if the timestamp of a transaction T1, so assuming that transaction TI needs to perform a read operation, right? Then it needs to check whether uh, its timestamp, right, the timestamp of T1, TI, is smaller than uh, the write timestamp of a specific object it needs to read. And if that happens, it means that this transaction TY is trying to read a record that has been written far in the future, right? That just violates the serial order we defined earlier, so this transaction needs to abort. Otherwise, this transaction, transaction can read that tuple and update the read timestamp of that specific object X to be the maximum of the original read timestamp as my current timestamp. And then this is actually not specified in the textbook, but in practice, oftentimes transaction TI also needs to make a copy of this object X to a private workspace so that next time when it reads this um, object X again, it will read, read back the same value, right? Otherwise, if some transactions from the future modify this value, right, even though that modifier could be valid, but then if transaction TI comes back, comes back and read that again, then it will be unrepeatable read, right? And then it has to, I mean, it, it, if that happens, it needs to abort, right? So in this case, if it has a local copy, then from now on, it can just only focus on this a copy, and then it doesn't need to worry about whether this mo value has been modified later or not. It's, yes, please. When we abort, we need to undo all of our previous Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, 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 yes. 
Yes, yes. You're right. <laughs> All right. Here. <laughs> so talk about read, then we'll talk about writes, right? So writes is a little bit more strict, right? Because we are modifying the record. Essentially, if you are write, uh, 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 you want to write to object X, right? Then your timestamp cannot be uh, older, oh, sorry, uh, cannot be smaller than either the read or write timestamp of that particular object, right? Because you, you cannot uh, let a, you cannot, you cannot write uh, to a specific record before a future uh, tra transaction needs to read it, right? And you can't really uh, modify a record before a I mean, future transaction needs to modify it either. Right? Both of them will violate the uh, serial order of this um, execution of this transaction. So in all cases, you need to abort. <laughs> and here, uh, if, if your timestamp is smaller than both, then you are allowed to write that record update the write timestamp, similar to what happened uh, to the read timestamp, and then also make a local copy, right? So that you can, later on, you can read that uh, record as well. All right? Give you an example. So here, uh, the first example, transaction T1, read on B, uh, read on A, and then read on A again, right? Transaction <laughs> T2, read on B, write on B, and read on A, write on A. So here, assuming that at the beginning of the universe, then there are some, uh, I mean, initial transaction, transaction zero, had already uh, written and, and read all the records, right? So all the records, the read timestamp and the write timestamp would be denoted at zero in this case. And here, at the beginning of each transaction, we assign them a timestamp, and transaction T1, assign, uh, let's say we assign one, transaction T2, for example, we assign two. Here, first read on B, and then we, we do need to look at the read timestamp, of the transaction, uh, sorry, of, of the record B, and because we are in transaction T1, we update this uh, timestamp to be one, right? Here, transaction T2 comes down, read on B, and then similarly, we update the read timestamp of the record B to be two, right? Here, we need to write down, <laughs> write on B. Here, of course, we need to check all whether there will be conflict, right? But I, I actually uh, skipped that step. But here, for example, before writing, before writing on this record B, it needs to check that both the read and write timestamp of this record B would be smaller my, than my current timestamp of this transaction two, right? In which case this is valid. So I modify B and then write the uh, write timestamp uh, here, right? Here, again, read on A, you check I mean, this is valid, right? Here, another read on A because I mean, no, none of the uh, read or because the write timestamp is smaller than the timestamp of transaction T2, right? So I'm allowed to uh, mod to read this record and uh, update the read timestamp, and then similarly, uh, this is also valid, right? Update uh, here, even though this read timestamp is higher than me, but if I'm performing a read operation in transaction T1, right? There's no restriction on the read timestamp, so I can do that. And then because two is already greater than one, we don't really need to modify this timestamp. And lastly, uh, there's a write on, write on A again, and again, it valid, it satisfy all our property. So we are allowed to uh, proceed, all right? And essentially, uh, it commits and uh, no violation of the serial uh, scheduling that we specified earlier. Make sense? Okay. So here, give you another example, right? So assuming that we have, uh, uh, again, a little bit simpler transactions, transaction T1, read on A, write on A, read on A, transaction T2 only perform a write on A, right? So what will happen here? Let's go through this. So first, again, read on A, that's super straightforward, totally valid, and then here, uh, write, on, uh, write, write on record A with transaction T2, also totally valid, right? Here, when it comes back, the transaction T1 also wants to uh, write a value on A. <laughs> but here what happens is that because transaction T1 has a timestamp, oh, I didn't denote it here, right, but essentially timestamp one, is smaller than the write timestamp of the record A. So this violates the uh, serial order that we defined earlier based on the timestamp of these transactions, right? So we cannot let this to commit, and then we have to abort T1, right, make sense? I assume this uh, makes sense, uh, no, no response, okay. But one uh, issue here we can observe is actually that even though according to this uh, basic timestamp ordering uh, protocol, uh, this, uh, all, the, uh, all this, uh, this transaction T1 is, is going to be aborted, right? Cannot, be, cannot continue, but in actuality, 
I mean, it, 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 it doesn't really matter if transaction T1 just did a write on A, right? Because what transaction T2, sorry, it doesn't matter if transaction T2 did a write on A in between, right? Because what transaction T2 does is just a blind write, right? It, 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 it write a record to A, never read it, and after it written that record, uh, the, the record on A written by T2 will be overwritten by T1 anyway. Right? So, so this uh, scheduling would be very well equivalent to that transaction T2 just, uh, I mean, didn't happen. And then uh, you didn't really even, so all, you just uh, let transaction T2 happen, but then there's no effect, right? So you can just tell T2, hey, you can commit, right? Your, your effect already be, be reflected in that database system, but at the end of the day, it's going to be overwritten by another transaction anyway, right? So transaction T2 doesn't, doesn't really need to know. And if transaction T2 does not need to read that record, then, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it will receive, I mean, it doesn't receive any different result, right? So that's what we talked about earlier, that for this blind rise, right, we talked a little bit about this in the view serializability uh, in the uh, classes uh, last week. Essentially, this is actually, this transaction scheduling would be uh, valid, but because we, uh, we uh, well, because we have this strict protocol from this uh, basic timestamp ordering, then we didn't allow that happen. Right. And we want to, because we want to always ensure a conflict serializability with the basic uh, timestamp ordering protocol. So one optimization uh, people have come up with uh, that can help with this uh, scenario a little bit would be called a Thomas uh, write through, right? essentially invented by some guy uh, named Thomas. So uh, what, would, what Thomas write through specified is that when a transaction uh, wants to write, if it, if that, the, the writing transaction timestamp is uh, smaller than the read timestamp of that tuple, then obviously I have to abort, right? Because that read, uh, the read timestamp is specified by a transaction that logically happened in the future, and if it doesn't see my write happen earlier, then this is wrong, right? So this always needs to abort. But then, if my writing transaction timestamp is only smaller than the current the write timestamp of that record, but it doesn't conflict with the read timestamp, then I would actually just ignore this write, right? We we'll just allow this transaction to continue because this write, if it happened, right, it will be overwritten by the future write anyway. Right? So from this, uh, from, if you look at the result, right, if you know the semantics of the transaction and if you look at the result of this transaction execution, it doesn't make any difference, right? Of course, if this transaction uh, future, it needs to read this record again, then it needs to check the timestamp accordingly, right? But this would definitely violate the timestamp order we specified earlier, right? Uh, uh, to, uh, for this uh, serial order based on this timestamp, but then from the end result perspective, right? Or from the view serializability perspective, the end result would actually still be correct. So this is just an optimization uh, that you can do. And of course, in all other cases, you will just write the record and update the timestamp, okay? So again, come back to our earlier example, right? It's the same example here. We have a read on A, right, and update the timestamp. And now we have write on, write on A from T2, also update the timestamp. And here, we have a write uh, operation on A from transaction T1. And from the read timestamp of A, right, it's, it's the same as the current timestamp, right, because both are one, so this is totally valid. And then even though my current write timestamp would be, uh, like the current, the, the timestamp of my current transaction, T1, would be uh, smaller than the T2, but we would still allow it to happen in this case, right? We'd just uh, blindly allow this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, transaction, the write from transaction T2 to hold, and then assume that this, this record is already being overwritten, right? And then we'll just ignore it, allow uh, dispose T1 and T2 to continue. And of course, when, uh, when this uh, T1 continues, it needs to read the record from its private copy, right? Because otherwise it will be wrong. So if it, if it only reads the record from its private copy, then uh, this transaction, I mean, would still be valid, right? And then it's just equivalent to a result where you first execute transaction T1, Right? And then read on A, write on A, and read on A. And later on, you just let transaction T2 comes after. Right? And then override the value written by A. And then this would still equivalent to a serial order, even though it violates the um, order specified the earlier timestamp we determined. All right, does that make sense? Any questions? <laughs>
do we need to go through this again? Because I, I don't see many uh, responses. I, yes, yes, please. Yes. Then in that case, you can't really just ignore the result of C2, right? Because if C2 happens first, then the result of C1 will still be different. Well, T2 logically happened, oh, T2 actually, well, T2 physically happened first, right? But logically, T2 actually happened after, right? So the execution of this transaction, assume that you T1 read, read on A, right, up increased by one, and then read on A again. Right. So after the first read, everything happens in the private copy. Right. So this would totally be valid. And the value written by T1 would just be overwritten by the value log of, of from T2 logically happen later, even though the actual write happened earlier. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. So um, again, so uh, this is going to the basic timestamp ordering protocol would generate a schedule that is conflict serializable, right? But of course, like I mentioned earlier, it wouldn't allow blind writes, and then it will, would uh, make, uh, make certain, it would not allow certain uh, serializable schedule that could have happened. Right? And essentially, a Thomas write rule would allow, make, make this uh, ordering or the uh, scheduling of the transaction a little bit more flexible and allow uh, a little bit more uh, concurrency. Uh, with the Thomas right rule. And uh, there's no deadlocks, right? Because, I mean, there's no, no transactions waiting for anywhere, right? So that, that's what it means that this is a uh, optimistic concurrency control, right? Do not hold any lock. And, but the problem, and actually there are a few problems, right? But one problem is that um, it's possible for this transaction to have a starving issue, right? Because unlike, for example, the um, deadlock prevention protocol we talk about, right? We have this mechanism to always uh, prioritize transactions that happened earlier. Here, in this case, I mean, the longer you stay, I mean, the longer that a transaction runs, the more possible that it has conflict with other transactions. And if you abort, and if you abort this transaction, transactions come back, there's no way you prioritize this transaction either, right? So this transaction uh, may have a starving issue uh, with this, uh, this protocol. And another protocol, Sorry, another potential issue with the basic timestamp ordering protocol is that it would also permit schedules that are not recoverable. Right? Again, assuming that we are not uh, put any uh, waiting on these uh, transactions, right? We just allow the transaction proceed if the timestamp uh, uh, if the timestamp do not violate the rules we specified earlier. So this is a little bit similar to the uh, cascade aborting problem we talked about last class with the basic uh, two-phase locking protocol, right? So essentially. If you uh, only look at a timestamp, uh, uh, and you, if you do not uh, let transactions uh, to, keep, to keep track of which transactions have read what records uh, on which transaction, then what will happen is that you will generate sc certain schedules that are not recoverable. And a re schedule is recoverable would mean that if a transaction uh, commits, it, uh, uh, sorry, a, a schedule is recoverable means that a transaction can only commit after all transactions uh, whose changes they read uh, commit, right? So uh, in otherwise, the database system would just, uh, if, if the testament don't do that, when a transaction uh, read a record from, a transac from another transaction that didn't commit, but the other transaction abort, then, I mean, this value, uh, if the system crash at the same time, this value would just be lost, right? And then after the system come back again, it cannot, find out, hey, what's the value of the other transaction that I read from that already been aborted, right? So this, the record will just be lost. So again, here, give me an example, right? Here, uh, transaction T1, let's say it did a write on A, right? And transaction T2, and read, uh, read on A and write on B, right? So here, transaction T2 can perform uh, the read or write, right? Because it has a timestamp that is higher than T1, right? Assume that it ha has a timestamp that is higher than T1, and then according to the basic timestamp ordering protocol, it will be allowed to uh, perform such read. But then after a while, if, if the transaction uh, aborts, then, uh, then, uh, right, assume that T2 already committed, right, after that, then assume that after a while, for example, there's a power failure, then the transaction T2, T1, or has to abort, then this record is just lost, right? Uh, T2 would actually read, would, would in that, at that point would have already read a value uh, that is uh, uh, written by a aborted transaction. And then this is uh, definitely be uh, invalid. 
So in this case, uh, the trisected, trisected T2 will actually not be a recoverable, right? If you know, the power, if for example, the power failure would be resolved and you're trying to restore the database to the original state. All right, so uh, in practice, in fact, as far as uh, I know, there are actually rarely system, actually, as far as I know, there's no system actually implement uh, this uh, basic timestamp ordering uh, scheduling, right? So many system would implement the uh, strong strict 2PL that I mentioned in the last class, uh, but then uh, many system actually implement another variant of the optimistic concurrency control protocol, which I will talk about in the, uh, in the, uh, later in this class. Uh, as far as I know, nobody really implemented this, um, this uh, basic timestamp ordering uh, concurrency control protocol. And be, uh, be, besides these a few issues I just described, there are also issues uh, such as, there are also performance issues, right? So I just described some logical issues, but then there are also performance issues, for example, every time this uh, transaction needs to access a record, it needs to first make a copy, right? And also it needs to update the read and write timestamp. And this is especially problematic for the uh, transactions that would only need, to, need to, would only need to read a few tuples, right? Because the read are supposed to happen much faster than write, no matter whether you are in memory or on disk. I mean, reads, the read operation would always be faster than write. But for example, here, if I have a transaction that only needs to scan an entire table, right? Let's say a billion tuples. Originally, I only need to read this a billion tuples, but now beyond the read, I have to need, I need to update the timestamp, the read timestamp of every tuple of this a billion tuple in my table, right? So this would actually add a significant overhead. And then, of course, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the longer transaction would also have this starving issue, unlike the uh, deadlock prevention mechanism we talked about for the uh, two-phase locking protocol last class, right? So there are quite some performance issues and logical issues of basic timestamp ordering, and in practice, uh, people generally uh, don't use it, right? So one observation we did here is that, okay, so if, the uh, premises of the optimistic concurrency control is that conflicts are rare in practice, right? Most transactions don't really have a conflict, so you don't need to lock things. Then why we are still updating so many timestamps while these transactions are executing, right? So if we are already assuming conflicts are rare in practice anyway, then why not to have an alternative approach where we actually uh, don't, at least don't update the read timestamp of these transactions and don't do so many conflict checks during the execution of the transaction, right, to block its operation. Instead, well, we still need to update the write timestamp, right, because we need something to ensure the correctness, but then we only check whether the transaction, transaction is conflict or not before it commits, right, essentially at the end of the execution. And then we just do all the checks at a, in a batch, right, together. So uh, instead of uh, doing all the checks uh, in between and then installing all those uh, timestamps, especially for read operation. So that's essentially another type of concurrency control, or not, or not, I should say another type, another implementation of the uh, uh, category of optimistic concurrency control using timestamps. And the name of this uh, concurrency control protocol, again, a little bit of naming issue would actually also be called optimistic concurrency control, right? That's the name of a specific implementation instead of a general category. So the interesting thing with the, this um, optimistic concurrency control algorithm or implementation is that it's actually uh, invented by a person uh, from CMU, right? Uh, it's actually uh, uh, a professor called KT Kang, and he actually invented this in uh, 1981. Right. And, and he's actually not even a database professor, right? Based on his specialties, he actually more doing network stuff, but then he just uh, happens to uh, invent one algorithm uh, in this area. And then right now, I think he actually had moved to uh, Harvard, right? Because I mean, at, at some point, Harvard wants to uh, improve their computer science uh, program, so I think they hired this uh, renowned professor to run their uh, entire department, right? So right now, he's at Harvard. Even though he's, he's kind of like, a, I think at this point, he's kind of like a retiring age, right? I don't know whether he retired or not. So in this uh, optimistic uh, concurrency control protocol or specific implementation, again, the database system will create a private workspace uh, for every transaction, right? Just a little bit similar to the uh, basic timestamp order and currency protocol we talk about. 
And then all the operations would be uh, copied uh, to this uh, private space. And then when, only when this uh, transaction commits, the database system will start to look at what records have been read or written in this private space and whether it conflicts with other running transactions at the same time, right? If there's no conflicts, then finally, the system would apply all the changes to our database system. And if there is conflict, I mean, it's also simple. The system just uh, throw away everything it has done, right? Then in that case, the overhead of a board is also, uh, uh, is also low, all right? So uh, let's get to the details. So there are three phases in this optimistic concurrency control protocol. And okay, it, it, still there's a little bit of naming issue. So in this read, the first phase called read phase, it can actually both read and write uh, tuples in that base system, but only in, in its private copies or private workspace, right? So the read phase just means that the transaction is not applying any changes or writes back to the database system, right, to the global database uh, content. But, but it can both read and write records in its uh, private copy of the workspace. And then the second space would be called a validation phase, where it just cat checks, I mean, after it finishes all the read and write operation, uh, it just checks whether it has conflicts between other transactions. And if there's no conflicts, it will just uh, uh, enter this third phase, write phase, to install all the updates uh, this transaction has to back to the database system and then uh, commit, all right? So here, give you an uh, example. Uh, here again, assuming that we have a transaction T1 and T2, and I just uh, denote a different phase of these transactions uh, in this uh, illustration. And here, assuming that, I mean, for simplicity, we also assume that we just use this key A and B and C to uh, identify the, the, these objects or tuples, and then assume it has a, each object has a value, right? And again, in this case, we don't need the read timestamp anymore. I right? don't need to update that, but uh, we actually still need the write uh, timestamp because at the end of the day, we still need to check conflicts, right? So that is just uh, unfortunately unavoidable. All right? So here, each transaction would have a read phase and a write phase and a validation phase, all right? So here, let me go through. So here, the transaction T1 first has a, uh, a enter the read phase, and it would read the value of the record A, right? And then later on, it write the value of the record A. So T1 would have this a private workspace, right? Where it maintains the IDs and values and write timestamps of all the objects. It first read uh, this uh, value A, and here, right, it just, uh, I mean, directly copy everything in this private workspace. And similarly, right, transaction T2, it reads a record A and copy everything to the private workspace, all right? And here, transaction T2 immediately enter, enter the validation phase. And I will talk about the details of validation later, right? But essentially, as you can imagine, I mean, here T2 only reads a record, right? So it doesn't modify, it doesn't modify anything. So uh, T2 uh, succeeds the validation phase and it will just, uh, and, and only actually, it will, well, it will put, put, uh, proceed to the write phase, but, but it didn't need to write anything. But after the validation phase succeeds, actually at that time, which means that the transaction is already ready to commit, right? So everything is going to be uh, successful, right? Unless there's a power failure right, right in between, right? So at that, at that point, at that point in time, we're actually going to assign timestamp for that transaction. So this would actually be a little bit different uh, than the basic timestamp order and conversion control protocol we talked about earlier, right? Because in this case, we know, I mean, we are just going to allow each transaction to execute anyway, right? We don't really need timestamp uh, during the execution of these transactions. And after the validation, we know that we are going to commit that transaction. So only at that time, we assign a timestamp to this uh, transaction. And T2 got to assign timestamp one. And then in right phase, doesn't do anything, right? So transaction T2 finishes. And when we come back, to the, uh, uh, to the transaction T1, now it needs to write a value uh, on the record A, right? So here, what it does, I mean, if you look carefully, is that it changed the write timestamp to, uh, of record A in its private space to a placeholder, essentially, right, or infinity, because at that point, it has not been assigned to a timestamp yet, right? So it's just a, a placeholder. And then in the validation phase, right, again, I'll talk about the validation details later, but here it also succeeds the validation phase and it got assigned a timestamp T2 at that point, right? And it's going to succeed unless there's like a sudden power failure in between. So after that, it will just come to the write phase 
and then write this record uh, back to A, right, with this uh, timestamp T2 as the write stamp, and then commit. All right? So any question on this uh, illustration except the details of the validation I haven't talked about? On the three phases, any questions? Okay. How, now, we are going to talk about the uh, specific phases. So first, the read phase, like, this is sort of straightforward and we already kind of talked about this earlier. Essentially, uh, I mean, read phase transaction, just to read or write whatever records it wants. And then the only thing it needs to do is that it needs to keep a private copy, a private workspace of all the tuples it accessed and then it will just read and write on this private copy, right? That's just a read phase. Doesn't need to do any check. Here, I mean, the most important thing is just the validation phase, right? So all the logic happens here. Essentially, when a transaction invokes the commit command, right, when it's ready to commit, or it not ready, when it wants to commit, well, it will just immediately enter this uh, validation phase to check the conflicts, right? And obviously, the DLA system needs to check whether uh, the current schedule and the current updates or modification of this transaction would still generate a serializable schedule, right? And then what it does is that, how it does that is that just by checking the read-write set of this transaction comparing to the read-write set of the other transaction. And one important thing here, a little bit similar to um, the deadlock prevention mechanism we talked about last class is that there are just generally two types of checks you can perform, right? And in each type of check, you are only going to allow conflict from one direction, right? So in these checks, I mean, you say the validation succeeds only that when you either have, have when you have either, sorry, when you only either have conflicts from younger to older transactions, or if you only have conflicts from older to younger transactions, right? Uh, everything else, I mean, there would be possible that there, can there, there could be a cycle uh, in this uh, scheduling of the transactions and you are not going to allow them to commit. And again, this is similar to the deadlock uh, prevention mechanism we talked about earlier, right? By allowing only one direction of conflicts in the validation phase, you're just going to make sure that when every transaction commits, right, there's no cycle in the conflict graph. So the eventual scheduling would be conflict serializable. And if every transaction can guarantee that, then the entire scheduling would also guarantee that. Right? So essentially that would be called either backward validation or forward validation. And I will, I will give you some illustration. So here, again, so when a transaction uh, trying to commit, it will just uh, check whether uh, the uh, read and write uh, transactions, sorry, the read and write set of these transactions will be uh, overlap with other transactions, right? And here in the first example, the backward validation, right? We are going to check whether it has the read write set of my current committing transaction has overlapped with the read write set of the transaction that has already been committed, right? So, so because we are checking with the older transaction that's called backward validation. And here, assuming that we are looking at transaction T2, right? So assuming this is the physical time, right? Transaction T1 has committed, we are looking at a transaction T2 and transaction T3 has not committed, right? Assuming that we are currently at this time point. And in the backward validation phase, we are going, just going to look back, right? We are going to look at, essentially, we're going to look at uh, this region that's called validation scope to see whether my current transaction, the read-read set of this transaction, has any conflict or overlap, in other words, with the transaction that has committed earlier, right? So in this case, I prevent any conflicts between uh, from a younger transaction to an older transaction, right? If there's any conflict, I immediately abort. I only allow conflicts from older transaction to younger transaction, right? So again, in this case, there will be guaranteed there's no graph. And of course, the other direction will just be called a forward validation, which means that when a transaction, again, this transaction wants to commit, it only checks whether its read-write set has conflict or overlap with the transaction that are still running, right? If there is any overlap, then it needs to abort. So this way, it avoids any conflict from a old transaction to a younger transaction, right? Again, in the conflict scheduling, in the, in the wait for, oh, sorry, in the conflict graph or dependency graph, they will guarantee that all the edges are one direction and there will not be cycles, right? So the schedule would be a conflict uh, serializable. All right, 
Any question on these higher level concepts before I get into the examples? Okay. Yeah, again, the validation scope here would be just be this uh, small region here, okay? <laughs> so uh, here, I mean, for the purpose of discussion, we are going to focus on the uh, forward validation, right, in this class. Uh, I mean, backward validation is just very similar, right, just to reverse it. So uh, each transaction, again, would be assigned a, a, a timestamp at the beginning of the validation phase. And then we are going to uh, check the ordering of this uh, committing transaction with, with, well, we are going to check the timestamp ordering of this transaction, right, comparing to all the other currently running transaction, right. And, uh, well, more formally defined, even though for the current running transaction, because they have not entered the validation phase yet, obviously they are not going to assign timestamp, but for the purpose of our discussion and also a formal analysis, we are going to assume that we have a timestamp for every transaction. And obviously for the transactions that are still running, right, have not validated yet, they will have a timestamp that is higher than the current transaction, right? So here we are just going to look at uh, whether a transaction would be allowed to commit or whether it satisfy uh, the, uh, the conflict uh, serializable property uh, when this, uh, we, and, and, uh, when looking, only looking at the transactions, other transactions that has a timestamp higher than my current transaction. Right? So we're only, lo only looking at one direction from the conflict graph and assuming that my current transaction is uh, transaction T1, only looking at other transactions with a timestamp higher than TTI. So here, in the uh, basic, uh, sorry, not basic, in the, uh, uh, the first condition, right, with this optimistic concurrency control, which would be uh, the scenario where transaction TY, TI, sorry, keep it called TY, transaction TI has complete uh, all the three, three phases before uh, transaction TJ begins, right? So again, this is actually not a case that you need to check in practice, right, just for the purpose of like completeness of the theoretical analysis, because if, transaction T1 or TI already completes, then you would already uh, finish all the validation and the right phases, right? But then again, for the, uh, I mean, the textbook definition of this, uh, this uh, optimistic heuristic control, uh, as well as for the completeness of the analysis, we categorize this as one scenario where TI already completes all the phases before TJ begins, and obviously this is always valid, right? There's no anything you need to check. So here, Again, it's like a very uh, naive, or like you can even say a stupid example, where a transaction TI just to finish everything before T2, then this is, uh, this is obviously uh, valid, all right? Okay, second, in the second scenario, that's where a uh, transaction TI has completes all its phases, right? But then TJ has not start its right phase yet. So again, this is like a, for our theoretical analysis, this happened, but in practice, I mean, you would do the check in the validation phase, right? Here, assuming that TI already finishes all the phases, you only need to check whether TI has written to any object that is read by TJ, right? You actually don't need to check what uh, record TJ written if TI already finishes all the uh, operation. So here, give you uh, some example, right? So here we have a transaction uh, T1 and T2. Assume that uh, T1 read on A, write on A, and T2 read on A, right? So here, in this case, when uh, T1 enter the uh, validation phase, right, it has, um, so in, in, the, in, the, in, well, in this validation phase, uh, T1, because T1 has uh, the T2, all the other two posts read by T2 is after, right? So, let me, let me check, double check this. Actually, maybe there's a mistake. Yes, yes, exactly. So uh, because in this validation uh, phase uh, start, T1, uh, T2 has not uh, start uh, this is validation phase uh, yet, right? So in this case, uh, T1 has uh, written to a record that has a uh, later on uh, modified, not, not modified, but read by a current running transaction, right? So in this case, this is actually uh, not allowed. So in this case, T1 has to abort, right? Because uh, in the transaction T2, before the validation phase, it has already read a record, right? This is the size is correct. Okay, here, but assume that in another case, right? So assume that in another case, transaction T2 finish its validation phase earlier, right? And then only after that, T1 comes back and start its validation phase. And in this case, 
what's the rule here, right? Because T2 actually has already finished the validation phase, then T2 actually already being assigned with a timestamp, right? So in this case, even though I didn't specify what timestamp exactly there are, but the T1 must have a timestamp that is actually already higher than T2, right? So even though in this case, physically, right, the write on A from T2 actually happen after the write on A, but because transaction T2 is validated earlier, then it has a timestamp that is earlier than the timestamp of T1. So in this case, I mean, even though the physical time of this read-write operation has not changed, but because the validation time of T2 is moved earlier, this is actually allowed under our rules of the optimistic concurrency control. All right, because I mean, at this point, uh, T2 commits logically before T1. All right, does it make sense? Uh, any questions? <laughs> okay, so uh, let, let me just uh, finish the, the, the third uh, rule, right? I'll give you some uh, a more a concrete example, right, hopefully. So uh, the third rule, right, is actually uh, what you would use uh, most common in practice, right, when you check uh, whether the transaction is valid to commit in a validation phase, would be that when transaction T1, sorry, keep saying it, yeah. when transaction TI completes its read phase, right, right, we, when it enters the validation phase, but TJ have not completed its read phase yet, right? So in this case, T1, TI completes the read phase, but the TI, uh, TJ is still reading or writing uh, tuples, uh, so I, you, don't know, you don't know whether TJ would be, I mean, read or write any other tuple in the future. In this case, you actually have to check both the uh, tuples read and write by TJ, right? Essentially, any tuples written by TI, TI cannot be either re read or write by transaction TJ, right? This is a very strict because you don't really know what TJ will do afterwards, right? So you cannot conflict with the tuples either read or write by uh, transaction TJ, right? So here, come back uh, to this example, right? So here we have, uh, again, read only. Uh, so, but the, the example has changed a little bit, right? We have transaction T1, read on A, write on A, and transaction T2, uh, read on B, and, and uh, read on A, right? So here, we look at the validation phase, right? Here, we assign a uh, trans, uh, timestamp of transaction with, uh, with, uh, with one. Here, we look at the other transaction because the other transaction only operates on the record B, right? So, I mean, obviously, there's no any conflict. And then we can uh, let uh, this uh, transaction uh, T1 to commit because I mean, all the operation would be happen related to record A from transaction T2 would only have happened later, right? At this point, we haven't seen anything yet. So this uh, straightforward, this will be allowed to commit. And then after a while, when a transaction T2 comes back, right, it will read the record A and then of course, in the private workspace, it also needs to update uh, this value of the record A, right? And after that, when the T2 enters the validation phase, well, it will look at whether it is, has written any record that will be violated with the uh, other transactions that is uh, that are operating on record, record, uh, record. Sorry, it will check whether it has written any record that is either read or write by any, any other concurrent running transactions. So in this case, T2 only do read, right? Read on B, uh, read on A. So when transaction uh, T2 trying to validate, it also uh, I mean, satisfy all the rules and it can also uh, commits uh, as, as, it, as it needs. All right? Okay, so we have uh, finished talk about all the, uh, all the uh, rules uh, of this uh, optimistic concurrency control. Any uh, confusions? Because I don't see uh, much response. <laughs> well, again, like, if you have any questions, I, 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 I may not have time to answer too much questions right after class, right? Because there are other meetings, but if there's any quest, uh, questions, you can uh, either post on Piazza or uh, go to my office hour tomorrow afternoon, right? We can, we're happy to discuss in more details, all right? So now, uh, talk a little bit about the write phase. Write phase is also a little bit straightforward, honestly. It's just, uh, I mean, just when the validation phase uh, succeeds, you just write uh, whatever changes uh, in this write phase back to the database, right? Whatever. Uh, read, uh, records that has been modified this transaction. And the only thing probably to note here is that 
uh, in most system, you would only allow uh, one transaction to happen uh, at the right phase, right? Because it's, even though it's called optimistic concurrency control, at the right phase, we are trying to modify the content of the database, you still need to take a lock, essentially, right? To make sure that you apply all the modified modification from this transaction to the database in an atomic fashion. Uh, there are methods to make this right concur concurrent, uh, but they are pretty complex. And uh, uh, in practice, uh, most people don't really do that. Uh, but, the, but the argument would be that because is, we are, we've already finished all the operation of this transaction, right? We already know what records we read, we write. We only need to apply the values instead of uh, trying to, I mean, perform join algorithm, et cetera. So the write phase uh, should be short, and so that we can take this lock in this case, right? That's the argument there. So again, the, uh, for the scenario that this optimistic concurrency culture would benefit, they would be mostly benefit a scenario where the conflicts is low, right? Essentially, uh, for example, when all the transactions are read-only, right? Then in the validation phase, you don't really need to check anything. Or, for example, uh, when the transactions just are accessing a different, uh, are accessing disjoint subsets of the data, right? In this case, the uh, validation overhead is also low because, I mean, there's nothing overlapping to check. Uh, so, I mean, if the database is pretty large, or if, and if the workload is not skewed, then there will be actually be an ideal case for this to happen, right? Because in this case, the database has many records, and different transactions will, have a, will likely to uh, access different parts of the system. If the database system is very, very skewed, right, then it's kind of degenerated to the, it kind of degenerate to the case of uh, two-phase locking, right? Because if the database system, system is, uh, the workload is very skewed on the database system, right? Every transaction is just uh, accessing one single record, then uh, every, most of the transactions would have a conflict. Would, uh, you would have aborted the most of them anyway, right? So at the end of the day, probably only like one or a few transactions can commit, and in two-phase locking, it will be uh, similar, right? So this would be beneficial uh, when the uh, conflict of the conflict rate of the transactions are low, all right? Of course, there's just no free lunch here, right? So uh, even though it has uh, certain benefits when the uh, conflicts of the transaction are low, conflict rates of the transaction are low, I mean, there comes if the performance implementations, right? For most is that at the end of the day, you still need to copy all the data. Right, to this uh, private workspace to operate on. Otherwise, you cannot just let the transaction to keep continue without checking anything with others. Right? And this uh, copying overhead um, may also uh, give you uh, performance degradation. And then this valid, the second is lesser a, a issue, but sometimes could also be a bottleneck, which is the validation of write phase, right? So especially, especially during the write phase, uh, I said that most system would uh, only allow one transaction to write at a time, right? So if the write phase gets longer, then this may, at some point, at some, uh, and in some scenarios, become a contention bottleneck. And lastly, aborts in this scenario or in this uh, con optimistic concurrency control protocol would actually be more wasteful than uh, two-phase two locking, right? Because in two-phase locking, when uh, you identify that I'm, I'm trying to acquire a lock, but that lock, that lock acquisition is already causing conflict, you are immediately about the transaction and roll back all the changes, right? But in the case of optimistic concurrency control, no matter whether the transaction is going to be aborted at the end of the day or not, you're going to finish every operation anyway, right? Because you assume most transactions uh, don't, don't need to abort, you just do all the operations, made all the updates, but then at the validation phase, if you realize that you need to abort, then you have to throw away all the work you have done, right? So, I mean, you realize that you need to abort later, and you potentially can waste uh, uh, more work under optimistic concurrency control. So, again, there's no free lunch here. There's a trade-offs, pros and cons, and in practice, some there are, there are many systems either use optimistic concurrency control or uh, two-phase locking protocol, right? But not, not many, as far as I know, no, 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 not, nobody really used the uh, basic version of timestamp ordering that I mentioned uh, in the beginning of the class, All right? So uh, we actually, we finished talk about the uh, higher of the fundamental concepts of the uh, concurrency control uh, protocols already. 
right? Like I mentioned, we need to go a little bit over maybe five minutes in this class. We talk about a little bit additional issues that uh, people have dealt with beyond the uh, fundamental concepts of a concurrency control, and that's would related to the different isolation levels database system are actually using today. Right? But uh, before that, any questions about uh, either time stamp ordering uh, time or optimistic concurrency control? Are the examples I talked about earlier? No. All right. So we'll just finish up with the few additional issues and uh, different uh, variations of isolation levels, right? So so far we have only uh, talking about concurrency control protocol, where we assume that all the transactions are just read and update existing objects, right? We assume that the objects are fixed set, and then we haven't really deal with uh, the scenarios where we can insert, update, or delete tuples, right? So we'll just give you an example here, right? Assuming uh, we have uh, this, uh, I mean, this, but this problem is called a phantom, by the way. So assume that we have this table on uh, on people with ID, name, age, status, etc. Right? So here, transaction T1, for example, we are going to select uh, the maximum of age of all the table with the status equals to lead, right? For example, here. And then assume that we get a value of 72, right? Like, uh, like this is a maximum age. Then assuming transaction T2 comes along and then insert into the table with a record of age, uh, age, uh, age 96 and the status also equals to lead, right? So what will happen here? What will happen here is that, well, the transaction T2 can commit and then after a transaction T2 execute the same query again, then it will actually get a different value, right? It's unrepeatable rate, right? So, I mean, even though here, transaction T2 is not modifying any records that the T1 has read, right? No, right? It's like just insert a new record. But then this transaction T1 actually, I mean, have a anomaly problem, right? Where it reads a value for the second time, the value has changed, right? So this is not a, not what we call a correct read operation, right? So this problem would actually be called a phantom. And what's really going on here, right? We spend all these two classes talk about all these different concurrency and control protocol, right? Protect this and that and the confusing optimistic concurrency and control, right? And at the end of the day, hey, like we are not guaranteed a correct result in our database, right? So the problem that is happening here is that the fundamental theory of protocol of serializability only guarantees, I mean, the schedule is, is correct or serializable if the set of objects is fixed, right? But in practice, of course, I mean, things are not this way, right? There are things that they're not handled by the fundamental concurrency control theory or protocol, and the phantom problem would be a one example, right? So uh, that will happen when you uh, insert or update, oh, sorry, insert or delete records from the database. So in general, uh, there are three ways to deal with uh, this uh, phantom problem, right? You can, uh, I will just uh, quickly uh, go through them. The first would be actually be a re-executed scans, right? So this is actually uh, kind of straightforward, right? So what this does is that when you first execute a query, any query with a where clause, you just record all the read set of this query, right? And at the end of the transaction, before you're trying to commit, you execute all the query with a where clause again. And to check that whether the queries of all these queries with the where clause, whether the read set of all of them would be the same of the read set of the, the, these queries you first time you execute them, right? If yes, you commit. If no, you abort. Straightforward, right? Uh, this, this, this would work, right? This is correct. But of course, this is very costly, right? But this is one way to deal with it. Another way would be called a predicate locking, right? Which would, this actually, again, this is rarely, really used because it's very difficult to implement. And the only system that sort of implemented would be an advanced system called Hyper, but even Hyper is not quite implemented, right? But the basic idea is that you actually trying to map out the high dimensional space of the where clauses that are in your scan clause, right? And you lock this hypo hypothetical high dimensional sub subspace in the entire space of your table, right? So, so again, here for example, right, again, this is the same, same uh, Table, right? Assuming that because we only have two dimensions here, either the age or the lead, we, we draw a rectangle here, right? Assuming that's the entire space of the record. So when the first transaction comes along, we're trying to read this, uh, this, uh, read this record, right? It's just, uh, I mean, perform a where clause selection and it will have a I mean, have a hypothetical space in the high dimensional space where all the records, where that contains all the records with status lead, right? 
And then you know, under this method, the system will just try to lock out this entire mathematical space. Right? And then when the next transaction comes along, because it's trying to insert a value that with age 64, sorry, 60, uh, 96, but also with the status equals to late, it will belong to this space that has already been locked, right? So in that case, system will detect this is invalid and it will just abort. But again, in practice, it's actually very difficult to calculate and maintain those hypothetical subset of space in the entire space of all the records, right? So again, like um, rarely people use it. And even for the system, only system does it, it's, it's not quite uh, uh, exactly implemented either. But what is actually a very common is actually something called index locking, where you actually, with the assistant, assume that there's the assistant of the index. What you will do is that you actually just look at this index data, data structure, and then for a partic particular predicate, for example, status equals to lead, if you have the assistance of the index, with the, uh, on the attribute status, then you will just lock out all the pages within that index of the status lead, right? So essentially, with the assistant of the index, you just lock a subtree in this index, right? All a few pages, if that's a leaf node, then you can prevent other records or transactions from accessing uh, the same record with that index. And then, for, uh, of course, there could be cases where you don't really have this, um, this uh, status equals to lead in that index, right? In that case, you have to do a little bit of calculation and to, to sort of calculate that which node this record will be inserted into if there's a record with status equal to lead and you lock that higher level node and the entire subtree, right? And then when other transaction comes along, it needs to check whether uh, that, that subtree has already been locked. Yeah, and well, of course, what, what if you say, hey, there's no uh, record with uh, status lead, oh, sorry, if, there, if there's no index, well, then you just fall back to the original method, right? You either do the scanning method or you just lock the entire table, right? That's what you will do. So that essentially comes up with the, uh, we'll just make two, like, use two minutes to finish, that essentially comes up with a little bit of this discussion of the isolation level in practice, right? Because you see in practice, even though uh, you guarantee serializable, then there are also this and that other uh, problem that can occur beyond the fundamental theory of uh, serializability. And even for uh, serializable isolation, I mean, there are lots of checks you've got to do and there are lots of performance implications, right? Copying records, doing lock checking, doing lock checking, et cetera, right? So in practice, actually most system not only specify one isolation level, but it will actually, they will actually specify, they will actually allow multiple isolation levels in the system, right? They implement those features, and you can sort of pick and choose what, how strong you want this isolation level would be. Essentially, what type of conflicts you would allow, right? For example, here, uh, uh, there, there could be this, a few uh, conflicts we talked about earlier, dark trees, unrepeatable reads, or phantom reads. The system could actually allow the users to specify that, hey, either I allow dark trees, or I allow unrepeatable reads, or, or I allow phantom. Right. In that case, the system can restrict its checks and then potentially has a better performance. And then this would have different names on these uh, different serialization levels, right? For example, in the highest level serializable, you just don't allow phantoms, allow, uh, uh, you don't allow repeatable reads. In other words, all reads are repeatable, and then you don't allow dirty reads, right? In the repeatable reads uh, isolation level, you actually allow phantom to happen. Right, then I mean, the, 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 the system would not need to do the predicate uh, locking as well as the, all the re-scanning re that I mentioned earlier, right? Or in the read committed level, you not only allow phantom, but also you allow unrepeat over reads, right? To actually allow more ske uh, flexible scheduling. And then lastly, in the read committed, you just allow anything to happen, right? I and mean, the system actually give you the option to do that if you, I mean, in some cases, you may just don't care about this specific protection. Right? Actually, then I'll stop here. Uh, next class, I will just uh, give you, I mean, a, a few uh, specific examples of isolation levels, and then we'll uh, start from there and talk about the last uh, type of uh, algorithm or implementations in the concurrency control topic, which we call the multi right? And then we'll finish up all the discussions of concurrency control. All right, thanks everyone. Yeah. Okay.
what I'm about to say, now it's brewed. Run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent. Bust is mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, pass the mic on to my no fellow. For a mic check, bust it. The fuse all set, then grab a 40. Then put him the yoga, snap his neck. Say nine. Take a sip, then wipe your lips. You, my 40's getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E-Trouble, get us a St. Ice Brew on the double.